stakeholder ideas said, but wait a minute, large companies around the world now have the potential to affect a lot of lives. They can decide which towns succeed or fail by where they decide to put their manufacturing plants. Uh, they can affect the lives of their workers. They affect the sa health and safety, perhaps, of their the customers. And through their taxation, they affect the success, or not, of states themselves. In the UK, a report by Lord Watkinson. In the United States, a proposal from Ralph Nader, the consumer activist. Uh, and in the United Kingdom as well, a report from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, England and Wales, all advocated a rethink of the concept of the corporation. The idea behind it was that companies, particularly large, significant, influential companies, which had the potential to affect lives of communities, individuals, and indeed of states, that they should accept a responsibility to a wider set of stakeholders than just their shareholders. These ideas were also not very well received in the boardrooms of Britain or the United States. And indeed, the Watkinson Report, Ralph Nader's uh, new proposals for company law, and the Chartered Accountants Corporate Report also went onto the shelf. The fascinating thing is that those stakeholder ideas have now reappeared in the early years of the present century. How thinking is being shaped, not to accept those original 1970s, now seen as rather naive ideas, but to rethink the place of corporations in society. But I should move on towards the first arrival of the phrase itself, corporate governance. That brings us into the 1980s, and unhappily, a whole series of company collapses. In the UK, it was Robert Maxwell's company, Alan Bond in Australia. Uh, in Japan, it was a famous company called Nomura, which got into trouble with uh, uh, relationships with, with the politicians. In America, Ivan Bursky and his firm, Burnham Drexel, abused insider information which they had to acquire private wealth. Insider trading is an issue we will be discussing at some length in this series of lectures. And in Hong Kong, we had George Tan and Carrion Investments. Let me just say a word or two about these uh, stories. We don't have a lot of time to go into each other, every one of these stories and a lot more that occurred in the 1980s are themselves living case studies. Let's look at Maxwell for a moment. Very interesting man. A refugee in, uh, from uh, Eastern Europe in the Second World War. Clever man, spoke many languages fluently. Very decisive man. In his early years, as a young, young man having arrived in England, he built up the Pergamon Press which published uh, academic papers. Did very well for a while, till he overextended himself and it collapsed. The collapse was so great and so many people lost their money that the government, through the Board of Trade, appointed examiners. The examiner's report very clearly said, this man dominates companies and he should never again be allowed to be a director of a British public company. 20 years later, he was running two of the biggest public companies uh, in, the, in the country, apparently quite successfully. The original inspector's report somehow had been overlooked in the success uh, that Robert Maxwell appeared to have had in running the large group of uh, Mirror newspapers and another publishing house called MCC. On the face of it, he was following all the appropriate um, rules, expectations of good governance. He had some most distinguished members on his board, but the reality was he was still dominating. Uh, the directors, it appeared subsequently, after both companies had gone seriously bankrupt, 
the directors didn't really know what was going on, which involved, in fact, Robert Maxwell using the company's monies as though they were his own. Uh, even switching assets into family companies, and worst of all, taking the funds from some of the trusts of his employees and using those for his own benefit. The end of that story was unhappy, unfortunate. Uh, he was discovered uh, in the sea, drowned uh, off his uh, family yacht. There are a lot of fascinating stories as to what happened to him, uh, but that is not a suitable subject for this lecture. What is, is that Robert Maxwell's, uh, the collapse of the Robert Maxwell companies led to the recognition that all was not well with the governance of, in this case, British companies. But as I say, companies were failing, shareholders were losing their funds around the world, including Hong Kong. George Tan, who was a Singaporean, bought Gammon House in January 1980 for 996 million Hong Kong dollars. It's the building you'll now know as the Bank of America Tower. He sold it a matter of months later for 1.6 billion. He'd made 600,000, just like that. Then he acquired a, a listed company, a company listed on the stock exchange, but which wasn't actually trading. The company would be referred to as a shell company. And he took all his assets and he backed that into the shell company, so he was now running a Hong Kong listed company, Carrion Investments. And it appeared to blossom. It had interests in finance, shipping, insurance, property, restaurants. It owned the largest Hong Kong taxi firm at the time. So successful. And the senior partner, Bryce Waterhouse, at the time was appointed as managing director until three years after its creation it collapsed in a very dramatic way. Uh, the story is again a case study in its own right, but suffice it to say that accounting fraud of a high order was alleged. It's a story of bribes. The bank auditor came from the Bank of uh, Malaysia. Uh, he was found murdered. One of the advisors to the company took, uh, uh, committed suicide until finally the ICAC raided the company and it became the largest Hong Kong bankruptcy to date. So all around the world, major companies were collapsing and shareholders were losing their funds. Not surprising, by the end of the 1980s, there were calls for corporate governance codes. We need some principles. We need some recommended good, good practice which goes beyond existing company law. The first code was that of Adrian Cadbury, now Sir Adrian Cadbury. It's been enormously influential uh, all around the world. Uh, the UK subsequently, as you can see from this uh, slide here, has subsequently produced many, many further corporate governance reports. But the important one was back in 1992, Sir Adrian Cadbury's report on the financial aspects of corporate governance. 